Welcome to Embedded. I am Elise White, here with Christopher White. Our guest is Brittany Posnikoff, also known as Straith. We'll be talking about robot social engineering and other things. Hi, Straith. Hi. Could you tell us about yourself as though we saw you on a panel about robots? Sure. Um, So right now, I am a researcher and community manager for Great Scott Gadgets. And otherwise, I am a troublemaker. I primarily just look at how things can be changed, broken, and um, adjusted using robots, specifically uh, the emotional side of robots. Do robots have emotions? That is a very big philosophical question, (laughs) and it depends on who you are and what your perceptions of emotions are, Um, but I'm inclined to be somewhere in the middle. All right. Well, we're going to ask more about that and other things, but first we want to do lightning round where we'll ask you short questions and we want short answers, and we'll try not to ask for more details, but who knows? Sure. If you were to make a Gibsonian cyber deck... What would you put in it? I keep thinking food. (laughs) Should we bring back the dinosaurs? Yes. Preferred listening one programming. Electro swing. It's a genre I've never heard of. I'm going to go look it up later. (laughs) Are fake tattoos a type of sticker? Yes. Googly eyes or puffy animal stickers? Googly eyes. If you could be a sticker, what kind of sticker would you be? Holographic. Oh, right. Holographic sticker. Do you like to complete one project or start a dozen? Start a dozen. If you could teach a college course, just one, what would you want to teach? Ethics. What is your favorite fictional robot? Bender. (laughs) Do you have a tip everyone should know? Turn your clothes inside out before washing them. See, but I hate that because then I have to turn them outside in after drying them. It's so much work for me. (laughs) So much work. It it pills less and it looks better longer. All right. (laughs) Okay. So we've touched on stickers (laughs) and robots and emotions. Uh, Which one do you want to talk about first? Let's start with stickers. Okay. So... You're into stickers. What does that mean? You have a Twitch stream where you talk about stickers. I I don't understand. So stickers are a big part of hacker culture. And, you know, I love seeing the stickers on the backs of people's laptops or on the other devices they carry. And I had this question about, like, what does the sticker mean? What does that sticker mean? And after talking to people, you realize that stickers have so much history and story behind them uh, that kind of gets lost if you don't archive it somewhere. So I've been working on this idea of, like, a sticker archive uh, for the stories about stickers so we don't lose that information as people leave the community or move on or other things like that. Okay, that's genius. So this is like, there are many different Hackaday stickers and some are older than others and some you could only get at certain conferences. Is it, is it that sort of information or is it the emotional attachment people get to their stickers? You know, both. Uh, I think all stories are worth writing down or collecting or having on a stream and sharing. And for me, it's just this idea that, you know, it's a big part of our our culture as people in tech. And it's nice to collect that culture somewhere. Um, So some of the stories are just like, you know, I saw the sticker, I wanted to be friends with someone because of the sticker, and now we are. Or sometimes you get, you know, the stories behind the, this is not a camera sticker. And you want to like, why did somebody make that? And you get to hear that story that led up to somebody uh, doing that creative design. And I think both are really exciting just to you know, learn the thoughts that people are having around these cultural symbols. Okay. So you're probably somebody who knows the answer to this question I've had. When I started in tech, it was when Friends was on television and um, <laughs> or the early seasons. And, and I don't, we had laptops and stuff. They were, you know, garbage compared to now, but I don't remember having stickers. I would have put stickers all over everything, but I don't remember doing that. And I don't really have a good sense of when that kind of started. I remember when I started putting stickers all over my laptop, but 
it was only like 10 or 15 years ago, maybe. Do you, do you have a notion of where this got started? No, but now I'm going to go and research it. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Report back. <laughs> I will. This is great. Thanks. So we recently re-aired a show with Sarah Petkiss, who then did our logo and stickers. And one of the things that I like best about our stickers is that some people see it as a radio head, or some people see it as a radio, an old timey radio, and other people see it as a robot head. And I love that ambiguity. Are there things you look for that make for good stickers? Uh, there's a few things like color, design, the quality of stickers. Like I have some stickers I put through the dishwasher and they're fine. There are some stickers you leave on a laptop for a week and they're gone. So the longevity is important to me. And I also um, try and make sure messages are positive. Like I have a whole stack of stickers that I will not interview people on that I will never put on my laptop just because they contain messages I'm not comfortable with. So, you know, just being positive, uh, having that good design and also using ethical uh creators as well. So there are some sticker companies that, again, won't use. And there are other ones that, you know, put a lot back into the company. So there are a number of things I look for. What are some that you will use? Because I think I'm ready to switch sticker manufacturers. Uh, I've heard great things about Sticker Ninja. And I've heard great things about, uh, I think it's Sticker Giant is another one. Um, but right now there's so many people looking for a better place to go and I have to try out more myself still. I understand. I'm looking at Chris's uh, laptop. I know I keep wanting to turn it around, but it's being used to record this podcast and that would be dangerous. And <laughs> I know that, um, Ben Krausnow's wrench in a beaker, uh, for his, his YouTube, what, what is the name of that? Channel? Yeah. His YouTube channel. What is the name? Of oh, oh <laughs> applied, applied science. Uh, applied science. Um, and Matt Godbolt's Compiler Explorer are both logos that have no words on them. And I, I wouldn't be able to tell what they were without knowing. Do you, what's your opinion on that kind of sticker? The, the, you have to be in the know to recognize it. Those are personally my favorite stickers, um, because I don't put stickers on my laptops that have words um, because I think it's more about just the the picture for me. Um, and also it's a great conversation starter. Like if you don't know what a sticker is, going up to somebody and asking, hey, what's that sticker is a great way to make new friends. And one of my favorite things about, about sticker culture. How did you get into it? Uh, I mean, was it one of these conversations where you went up to someone and said, what's the sticker? I mean, I do that all the time because I'm just very <laughs> curious. Um, but I think a big part of it for me was just, uh, you know, my first DEF CON, I saw these stickers. I'm like, wow, there's so much color and vibrancy to this community. And I mean, of course the LEDs helped, but, uh, the stickers were a good introduction and people are just like, here, take my sticker. I'm like, you're just going to give me a sticker. And at this time I was a student, like anything free made me happy. Um, so of course I'm going to throw stickers on my journals and stuff and people are like, no, you have to put it on your laptop. And then all of a sudden it's this like big choice. And I was like, well, now I just need to collect all of the stickers and I need multiples of all the stickers so I can stick them on things and be, and be happy. And so now I have a huge sticker collection. And of course I use some of them, but some of them I have just as an archive and it just has kept going from there. I get other people's stickers to send out when I send out our stickers because I don't want our stickers to be lonely. That's normal, right? Absolutely normal. <laughs> I have so many friends you would love to spend time with if that's your mentality around stickers. <laughs> I don't put them on my laptop, but my toolbox is covered in stickers. There's a sticker on your laptop? There's one. There's one embedded sticker yeah, on my laptop. Okay. I don't think that counts. That's more of a, here's our company property. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think there's a crossover between the sticker kind of ethos and uh, the badge thing? Very much. Uh, there are are a lot of 
people in both communities that share artwork back and forth. Um, And for me, stickers is kind of step one before I start getting into badges because um, so many of the cool conference badges have great PCBs that have fun designs. And it kind of, some of that uses the same skills as creating stickers. So it's kind of like a natural progression to me. So going back to robots, um, tell me more about robot social engineering. I mean, it's not really about tricking the robots to give you information like human social engineering, is it? Uh, So one aspect of it is, but for my master's thesis, it was more about using robots to social engineer people. Okay. I mean, if a robot asks me for my password, I might give it to him because it's a robot. It doesn't care. (laughs) What? I don't know. I just can imagine being in a situation where I unwisely trusted a robot because it wasn't a person. Fine robot. Like, is R2-D2 coming up to you and beeping, give me your password? Pretty much, is yes. That was what was in my head. No, or, no, no, it was definitely R2-D2. Or is it just like, you know, something on your computer where a fake robot comes up? No, those are clearly people. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love this. This is exactly uh, why I did this research is, um, you know, there's so many definitions for robot. And when I talk about robot social engineering, I specifically mean robots that are in a body Um, and are able to like interact physically with their environment, move around in that environment, um, and still have some form of artificial intelligence. So the things that pop up on a TV screen would not be uh, a robot to me. Um, So it's kind of interesting to think about how everyone has these different definitions. I mean, we gave our Roomba uh, the password to our internet. What? Well, yes. But it didn't ask. (laughs) <laughs> the app asked the robot the robot itself did not ask it was, it was a proxy it's not the same kind of thing what kinds of social engineering can the robots do other than get our wi-fi password so there are some things where how do i describe this um so robot social engineering has a number of parts there's um you know depending on the level of artificial intelligence of the robot. So some things like a Roomba would probably just be uh, a proxy for a human social engineer that has gone into your robot and uses the emotional connection you have with your robot to make you do things. Um, So for example, um, they can... Some Roombas, people actually remodel their entire house so it's more accessible for the Roomba. And people get these emotional attachments where they name them, where they pet them. What? People name their Roombas? That's ridiculous. (laughs) Who would do such a thing? We have googly eyes on our robots and we've named it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right? So you're 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 right in the perfect market for me. Yeah. Uh, but there are things where, you know, those robots, you start getting used to them and you get used to them moving around your house without uh, any interaction necessarily, like especially if you put it on a schedule. Um, and you get used to the noises, kind of like when you get a pet, you get used, you at first are like, what's that noise when they're moving around? But after a while, you get used to the noises. Now, say that somebody uh, is able to RDP into your Roomba and all of a sudden start looking around your house because there are cameras on Roombas, um, there is LiDAR on some of the Roombas, like there's so many different features that can collect so many different types of data. And say these robots go throughout your house and you have one of the ones with a camera, all of a sudden a person can use the social comfort you have with your Roomba to go around your home and case your entire house, like see everything that's in it, where it is, and also see or hear whether you're home. And so all of a sudden, say you go on a vacation for a week, somebody has been hiding out in your Roomba, um, you know, for a month, RDPing, watching, and they notice you're gone for three days in a row, which is really weird for you. Well, they know that's the perfect time to come in and rob you and where everything is, where the alarm systems are. They might have seen you arm them or disarm them through the Roomba's camera. Like there are all sorts of um, privacy and security considerations with the technology you let in your home. There definitely are. Um, Lately, our, our Amazon Echoes have been irritating me with not only their insistence on offering me things I don't want, but also... Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Amazon's new programs to make mesh networks and share your network and do weird things I didn't ask it to do. Do you think of those as robots? I mean, because that does have a social engineering aspect as well. They don't move, though. I don't because they don't move. To me, they're just a machine or they're an artificial agent. What if I tape it to the Roomba? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, why does Why does its ability to move make it more interesting to you? Because all of a sudden you have a walking, talking vulnerability. It's not just you know, a thing on your table that you talk to. Um, And that physicality is a big component of how we socialize with other people, with animals, and in this case, robots. Mm. Um, It's that physicality that really makes this a unique piece of research compared to seeing how an artificial intelligence online uh, affects people. That is a a different area that doesn't consider physicality. It's highly explored, but that doesn't apply to when you have a robot in front of you in a body. It's a different scenario. You interact with it differently. And there is research on how different those two things are. And so I was like, well, I want to look at this specifically. And so that's why I define robots so narrowly is because the physicality is really cool. Does that, does it plug into something deep in our brains that says this is alive, which is a difference from, say, the echo tube that is just a monolith? Yeah. So humans use things like anthropomorphism to uh, connect with the different things in their environment as if they were humans or other uh, humanoids. And then we have zoomorphism, which is when people treat things in their environment like animals. And robots can benefit from one, the other, or both at the same time, uh, depending on how you interact with them. And I think that's really special and cool. Do we trust them more because we... I mean, I don't trust people that much, but I think I might trust a robot more. I don't know. Yeah. We don't Uh, give our our Wi-Fi password to very many people. Well, yeah. Finish your question. I'm sorry. It was more like, is it, is it the fact that we do this zoomorphism and anthropomorphism that causes us to be more susceptible to social engineering attacks? Or is it just that we are so stupidly, uh, susceptible to social engineering attacks. This is just one more path. Uh, Both. And some of it has to do with context as well. Like if you have a robot coming up to you in a hospital, because there are some hospitals that have these robots that will come and deliver your medication to you. Well, it's a machine in an authoritative role in an environment where most people don't feel they have much authority. So if a robot comes in with a cup of pills and says, take this, Like, you might be more inclined to trust it, even though we, again, have the issue of you don't know who's programmed those pills, if they're the correct pills, if your pills got switched with someone else. Like, there are trust things to think about, but because of the context and and authority the robot holds, uh, some people might be more inclined to trust them. I remember talking to Professor Ayanna Howard about this, um, that even... If the robot led you in a psych experiment to the incorrect room, and so you knew that it was fallible, when there was a fake fire alarm, you still followed the robot, even if you kind of knew how to get out of the building. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with us as a species? (laughs) That is one of my favorite papers, and I did cite that one in my thesis because it was just like blew my mind that people could see an exit sign clearly pointing, just go left, but the robot was pointing right. So they went right. And like, like there's so much to think about there. And again, it's context where, um, you know, people freeze when there is a fire, there's panic. And just like, you know, when you were in public and we see someone getting hurt and that, you know, maybe somebody should call the cops or should, um, you know, intervene or help out. No one does it. Um, And there's a bunch of papers on this that no one wants to be the first to step up. So a robot coming in in this case and being like, hey, follow me to safety. You're like, okay, I don't have to think about it. Somebody else will think about it. Great. Tell me what to do. Um, And so I think that's, again, part of the uh, robot slipping into an 
authoritative position and taking the pressure off of you kind of gives you more of an inclination to trust it. It's interesting because a lot of science fiction has a theme of don't trust the robots, right? And and Mm -hmm. alien, the alien series and whatever, there's plenty of examples where the robot turns out to be uh, an enemy for some reason and you shouldn't trust it. Uh, And I feel like that, that should have subsumed into our culture over the last 50 years. Uh, But it doesn't seem like, that seems like a more of a reflection of our, our, our desire to trust them rather than a, a reflection of our distrust. Well, yeah. And we have for almost every bad robot there is, there's a good robot like C-3PO or R2-D2, or in my case, like Bender isn't exactly moral, but I would love him as a best friend. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's the thing is we always match kind of the good with the bad and it comes down to, you know, robots are as varied as humans. They come in so many shapes, so many different types, different thought processes, different skills. And, you know, when we make a decision on a particular robot, it comes down to, again, context, environment, um, what the robot does, why we think it does what it does, and all sorts of these complex variables that go into one value of trust. With respect to your example about people being hesitant to intervene in emergencies, there is also research to show that if you have any training at all, if you if people are trained to be responders, not even formally trained, but even the community emergency response teams, um, where it's a, a low level of training, they do tend to step up. Do we need to train people to be like, no, don't follow the robot, or how do we how do we get out of this? Because I don't really want to lose the personability of my my Roomba. I, I, I like its googly eyes. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. That gives me a lot of joy. Um, and I think a lot of what we need to do is just be aware. Um, be aware that a robot could be collecting information on you, and a lot of information that you don't necessarily know. Um, like a lot of the manuals on robots don't actually give you all of the details about what a robot is doing or what it's collecting or where its information goes or how its information is stored. Um, So it's kind of exhausting, but having the awareness and vigilance to think about robots in depth when you interact with them is what we need to do. Um, And yeah, training could help with that. I'm hoping that as I write more papers and give more talks, it kind of gives people that low level of training. Uh, But yeah, it's a really hard problem to defend against robot social engineering, just as it is to defend against regular social engineering. You said write more papers. Um, You have a master's degree, uh, but you are starting a PhD this fall? Yeah, I'm actually switching from CS to electrical and computer engineering, where I will be doing a PhD with a bunch of other great robotics people. And uh, one of them actually started working on robot social engineering around the same time I did, but they were living in Italy. Uh, So we will actually be in the same place at the same time, researching the same thing. So I am real excited about the research that's going to come out of our lab. And is it is it going to be on uh, robotic social engineering or, or robot as a whole, or do you have a an area of concentration? Yeah, I've been really inspired by Whitney Merrill to you know focus a lot more on privacy, and so I've always had this question in my head of like what are people's public perceptions of robots in public spaces and I have a story on that, actually. Um, so my partner and I were in an airport and we saw a robot around. And I was like, take my bags, check us in. I must go and look at this robot. And so I grab my phone, I start recording because I'd never seen this robot before. And it had the airport symbol on the side of it. And you could scan your boarding pass and it would tell you where to go and where to check in or where stores were. Or you could search for restaurants or it would turn its head around and take a selfie for you and email you uh, the selfie. And I'm like, wait, 
that robot is collecting a ton mm-hmm. of information. And I'm like, and the only reason people are trusting it is because it has a sticker on the side of it. And so I'm like, I could just like, I want to see if I could just drop a robot somewhere, throw a sticker on it and see if people give me their information, you know? So uh, this is a lot of what I want to look at in my PhD is how little context do I need to give uh on the robot for people to give it high levels of trust. Are you going to put stickers that people recognize or things that just look like something that is trustworthy? All you need are googly eyes. I'm telling you, that is the the lowest bar. (laughs) Um, Well, I'm thinking things like, you know, I'll be at the University of Waterloo. So can I throw University of Waterloo stickers on a robot have it wander around and ask people to, you know, enter a sweepstakes and get their personal information. (laughs) Or, you know, if I could drop it at a restaurant and how long would it take for the restaurant to kick my robot out, you know? Creating a robot is expensive still and likely to remain expensive for a while. So this level of interaction usually is related to a a company, iRobot, the airport, places that have, that that are big enough, uh, even Boston Dynamics, they have funding. And so if their robot is wandering around doing nefarious things with people's data, you can make a fuss, I guess. Like anybody really makes a fuss, but... Yeah, if you know that it's collecting the data and if you know there's something to make a fuss about. And I think people don't know that they're, they should be making a fuss about some of these robots. Um, like there are a few. I will absolutely walk the other direction if I ever come into contact with them. Like what? Uh, like the night scope robot, personally. Right. What, what's They're a security robot. They look kind of like Daleks. <laughs> They do. Oh my gosh, do they ever. I mean, is it just because it has a bunch of cameras? Does it have a laser? Does it, why are these bad? Does it have googly eyes? (laughs) No, um, I'm kind of happy these ones don't have googly eyes because I think it's bad to personify these ones because I don't think they're good for the public. Um, But if you go through their documentation, you can see that they have thermal imaging, that they have license plate cameras, that they collect the MAC addresses of any devices near them, um, that they have, uh, I mean, they have wireless access points on them that collect whatever uh, access points your devices are trying to connect to. So it knows what um, networks you usually try to connect to. They have cameras, they have audio, and they're collecting all of this data. And even if a company is the one that has set this out in their parking lot, you don't have notice that it's collecting all of this data and you don't know where it's going. And um, based on the documentation I've read, it looks like even if you think it's just going to the company, all of the data is going to Nightscope as well. So all of a sudden you have two companies using your data. Um, and Nightscope has done things like partnered with uh, various um, law enforcement agencies that people don't really respect and that um, make a lot of people's lives worse. And uh, it makes me uncomfortable to think that you know these robots are you know, breaking apart families and things like that. And wow. I mean, there's, there's so much here. Elevated body temperature. That is not something I want people to be able to, to know because that indicates that I'm stressed. Mm -hmm. Um, Although on the other hand, part of me is like, oh yeah, you put that in an airport and if anybody has a fever, maybe we don't spread disease quite as fast. But the balance there is just impossible. And these robots... I can, if there isn't already a cell tower in them in order to collect the base cell data, I, there, there will be in about a month. <laughs> it's right. just, these are the robots. I didn't realize that I spend so much time thinking about the good robots that I don't really think about these other kinds because I don't see them very often. Um and they're mostly used in larger cities and airports. 
Do mm-hmm. you think we'll see more as time goes on? Or do you think that there has already been some public backlash and there will be continued there will continue to be? Right now, I'm of the opinion that, yes, we are getting more and more robots in public, especially over the pandemic. There was kind of uh, an explosion of robot use, Um, like, you know, people putting robots in public spaces to take your temperature was a thing we saw a lot of over the last few months. Um, And also robots that would be in public spaces uh, asking people to step apart if you're too close. Um, Like there are some public parks, I think, in Korea that used these robots to say you were standing too close together, please separate. But the thing is the is the robot couldn't tell whether you were living together or not and whether it was okay for you to be walking together. So it's making these crude judgments on what should be allowed in public without actually knowing the context or the situation or finding out more. But because it was, you know, a big robot, uh, the spot robot, and you know, they are clunky, they are big, they seem like they have authority. Again, they have they were given vests and stickers that make them made uh, people know that they were part of the park. And so all of a sudden these robots have authority to tell people living together that share germs anyway to separate, um, which seems excessive and incorrect and like we're, you know, sliding down some sort of bad path. So they they're around and I think they'll continue to be around, especially as big corporations that have money continue to push the robots without thinking about the privacy and security and without the average person, um, you know, raising their voice against the context in which robots are used. It sounds like a lot of things are being delegated to them that should not be delegated to them because they're idiots. I mean, they're not, they're not AIs. But they say artificial intelligence on the side. Do they? Some of them, yeah, actually, <laughs> they really do. That's Bizarre. ridiculous, but okay. But yeah, I mean, they're 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 you know they're 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 heuristic things that just go out there and say, okay, here's here's a bunch of people, tell them to separate. That's all it knows. So it's kind of yeah. I mean, it, delegating human decisions to a robot seems very fraught. And yet, which is a place we... where security is is primarily is one of the big areas where you want human judgment. But if we could make ethical AI more of a thing, then maybe the robots would be more fair than humans who have biases. Okay. Um, go ahead. AIs will always have biases, though, because they're made by people. But if we if we start working on that piece, which is a totally separate piece, that we need our AIs to go through some path of certification towards uh, equity. And I think we will get there eventually, eventually. But there are benefits to having someone who is less likely to be cranky because they're hungry to do some of the enforcement mm, of like know. traffic, like parking enforcement. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I like having a human who can be responsible for misdeeds. And there are also sometimes like humans let things slide, like oh, I could give this person a parking ticket, but eh. and it's those counter uh, positive scenarios, like opposite from those cranky scenarios that are also human. But if you have a robot, it's never going to let someone slide. Like if it's if you're a minute late getting back to your car and it's normally not when uh, the parking meter people come by, like you usually slide by a minute, but robots and AIs hold up the rules because that's all they can do. And they don't know how to let things slide for positive reasons. And I think that's a show of humanity as well and a show show of compassion and something we don't want to lose by delegating things. I'm 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 still on the fence about that, but I, I I'm willing to, to 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 go either way. So, um, as Chris said, one of these looks like uh, a Dalek. Another one of these looks like the the kind of cool robot I think from Interstellar. The square ones. Yeah. Um, but as you said, straight they. They are intimidating. They're, or, or they look authoritative, and they are intimidating. It seems like if you really wanted people 
to be more interactive, you would put a fluffy bunny sticker on it instead of making it look scary. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of robot social engineering. Do you think that they look scary because they wanted them to look scary or that they look scary because nobody realized that they would be friendlier if you made them look friendlier? 100% both. Um, I think the night scope robots are definitely intended to look scary. Um, And it does look exactly like a Dalek. And I've seen pictures of people taping a plunger and a whisk to them. So (laughs) (laughs) Um, so they are definitely meant to look scary. But a number of other robots is just people being like, oh, I think this looks cool. And then they make it and people are scared of it or don't understand why people are unhappy with it. And like, why is my robot failing? And I'm like, because it looks like it's going to cut my knees off. Uh, So it's a little uh, difficult. And that's one thing that a lot of robot designers could do better is hiring human robot interaction specialists who've done research into uh, the shape, outfits, heights, and all sorts of other interaction variables um, that could help them design their robots better. But so far, that's not a common thing. I mean, when one of the first bullet points on your robot is force multiplying physical deterrence, I don't think (laughs) that your goal is to make something that looks fun. Mm -hmm. (sighs) I mean, that's going to be a pretty interesting research uh, project. Do you think you'll be able to get one of these scary-ish robots and see just how friendly you have to make it before people will interact? So there are things like I probably throw an apron on it, like a frilly pink <laughs> apron with some like flowers on it. And all of a sudden it would look more maybe like Rosie from the Jetsons. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so, and so there's these things like outfits that can make things a lot easier or, um, you know, just colors, like stop choosing scary colors and maybe use more yellows or purples or things like that too. Um, but yeah, that's not necessarily my uh, specific area of research. (laughs) And I would love to uh, talk more with people who do really focus on that in depth. But we don't put enough fur on robots. I was thinking that if you put uh, a pink leather collar on one of the Boston Dynamics terrors, (laughs) it would be pretty cool. People would be like, oh yeah. See, that's another, okay. Yeah. It's another set of company. It's like, are they doing this on purpose? Because these look like hellhounds. I mean, (laughs) Uh. Um, so you want to see more about people interacting with robots and try to figure out how kind, how nice, how personable you need it to look before people begin to fall for social engineering. Is that right? No, my focus is going to be on, um, whether people understand what sensors and abilities robots have, how those sensors and abilities can be used to collect data, and where their privacy and security might come at risk. And I want to demonstrate that through using robots uh, to social engineer people. Do you think that robots uh, that interact with us take more data than just walking through with a cell phone that isn't well protected? Yes and no, um, because they're, I'm not a hundred percent certain on this, but like, you could always say someone else had my cell phone that day, but if a robot is there and it's also got video and audio of you, eh, you're a little bit more in trouble. Or if it has your body temperature or other things like that, there's just so many other pieces of data that maybe your phone isn't collecting that robots are definitely collecting. Well, and people... I mean, at least theoretically, are in some control of their cell phone, right? You could leave it at home, you could turn it off, you can adjust the privacy settings and the location tracking settings. Lead box? You could throw it in the ocean. Um, but a robot is not under your control. It's in, it's in an environment that you happen to wander into, and it's going to collect stuff passively. It's the same issue with like facial tracking, right? And, and things like that, where you don't get to opt out. Even if it's hard to mm-hmm. opt out, there's with a cell phone sometimes there's no option to opt out with something that's just ambiently in the environment 
Yeah, especially when it's walking and moving and could follow you. Like if you go around a corner to not be in its cameras and it follows you because it thinks that's suspicious, that adds a lot of stress to your interactions and walking around and just existing. Is like if you try to get away from a robot and it won't leave you alone. Like how uncomfortable. Okay, so it's really about the robot's being able to gather data about us that we don't want, as opposed to the robots that we find attractive. That's not the right word, but I'm going to go with it. Attractive enough to engage in a social manner in which we give up our data purposefully. Or get tricked into. Yeah. Like private... Privacy is just, you know, being able to control who you give your data to, when and why. And so, uh, like was said, like with a cell phone, you control that. But with these robots, especially in public spaces, they are someone else's property. And, um, you know, there is questions uh, about laws. Like if you put a sticker on a robot to take away some of its abilities, like what laws are you breaking? Um, So even if you try and do small fixes to... Uh, increase your own privacy and increase the privacy of others, what laws are you breaking? Well, and like I have removable vinyl um, and I could imagine using that to disable cameras, but that even if it's not permanent, is that some sort of misdemeanor because I'm disabling their ability to track me, but I never agreed to be tracked. So why there are some pretty gnarly legal aspects here, aren't there? Mm-hmm. So you're not starting your PhD program until fall, um, but you are working now at Great Scott Gadgets? Yep, that's correct. I believe we talked to Kate Tempkin from there about USB uh, things earlier in the year or possibly last year, possibly a decade ago. I don't remember. Um, what do you do there? I am the community manager. So I have the fun uh, job of dealing with all of the GitHub tickets, uh, interacting, w- you know, being first point of contact for anyone who wants to uh, talk to Great Scott Gadgets or get customer support help. Um, I also h- will eventually help run events when we're out of the pandemic. And, you know, give talks and, you know, focus on giveaways. And I'll also be making swag, including stickers. What are you, uh, what are you going to do with your stickers? What, what are the things that you find most important that you're like, okay, on, on a sticker I do, it's going to have these things. Well, it's di- so it's a little bit different for things I would create in my own time versus things I would make for a company. Um, but, you know, I really love a lot of the great Scott Gadgets ethos, which is making everything as transparent and open as possible. Um, even the tagline for company for the company is making open source tools for innovative people. And I just I love how, f- you know, freely the company shares knowledge and Uh, One of my favorite things is looking at the different layouts for all the different pieces of hardware. And I really want to make some stickers and t-shirts and stuff that really like show that hardware since, you know, it's open, it's available, but I think uh, throwing that on a black t-shirt looks really cool. As part of being community manager, you, you deal with GitHub issues. Do you also work with software engineers who are contributing uh, to the open source parts of Great Scott Gadgets? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I help review pull requests. I try and ask questions to make sure, you know, we're talking about the same thing. And a lot of the GitHub issues end up turning into, you know, maybe you could try and fix this and people submitting their first pull request. So um, I definitely love when people open issues and pull requests because it gives me another opportunity to interact with and support people and see new ways to use the things that we've already made. Getting people to do open source, it's still hard. How do you get them to engage? 
One of the things that I've been trying to do in the company is respond to issues quicker. Um, I've tried to put a you know, service level agreement in that I'm going to respond quick uh, so people know that we care and that um, we want to hear their feedback. We want to hear what they're having issues with so we can make everything better. Um, so I would count issues as contributing to open source because it does affect um, how we think about what we're making, what products we want to make in the future. Um, so, you know, when people think about contributing to open source, they normally think of only contributing code, but, you know, contributing documentation, writing down the issues, um, joining uh, the Discord and like interacting with us and telling us what you want is always to uh, con- contribute to open source. And I really want people to focus on, you know, some of these other things other than uh, contributing just software because there are so many ways to be involved. Seems like um, there's a real mix in the the quality of, of various open source projects and how welcoming they are. What do you think are some of the keys to getting people to feel comfortable submitting a first PR or or an issue or something without fearing that they're going to be yelled at or or made fun of? Because that happens sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, I've definitely been in that scenario and um, it's what turned me off of open source for so long was, you know, people just being outright rude or saying like, this is too simple of an issue to contribute. We're not going to merge someone else's stuff when we can do this in a line. Like it was just antagonistic and rude. Um, But with Great Scott Gadgets, the fact that um, the company constantly went to conferences that I saw everyone um, constantly all over the world at all these places and that they were giving back through talks, through giving away hardware, through making sure everything was open source and really touting that. Um, And, you know, having uh, tons of videos and write-ups and stuff out there for people to learn from it. It was obvious that it was more than just a pet project. It was you know, kind of like a labor of love. And so that's one of the reasons I joined the company was just how positive um, all of these things were. And so, um, you know, that's something I look for when I uh, try to contribute to open source now is how much are they giving back to the community and accepting the community. I was uh, talking to a person who wanted to contribute to an open source project, a big one, not Linux, but a big one, um, and didn't understand why no one would help set up the computer in the right way. And I, I was like, okay, they have a getting started guide. I don't understand what your problem is. And the problem was that it took a long time to compile and they wanted help understanding how to get faster compiles. And I tried to explain that they have a lot of people who want to do a small change, who want to do a small change. Not a lot of people who actually do a pull request, but too many people to help every single one just get set up. Mm -hmm. Do you see that problem? Is there, I'm not sure I handled it well, um, other than trying to explain from the other side. Is there some way to say, Yes, we really want you to contribute, but could you please not waste our time? <laughs> that is something, uh, honestly, I've been struggling with uh, now that I am, you know, first point of contact for the GitHub issues is that before me, there wasn't anyone dedicated to this. It was, you know, software engineers who had a bit of uh, spare time or, you know, other things like that. But it slows down the open source project every time um, we need to help someone. And so, you know, I'm really happy that Great Scott Gadgets grew enough that they were able to pay and hire me um, because the company is doing well enough. Um, So now I can go in and do that, but not every open source company can afford to hire someone. And so um, another way to contribute to open source and help other people is to be part of the community and watch projects that you like for how they do try to solve issues and try to help other people. Um, And so right now I'm doing that by looking at old issues and how they were solved, 
seeing if new issues match up and being like, okay, well, we've tried these sort of solutions in the past on these issues. Let's try that again over here. And, um, you know, using those um, issues and going back and forth is one way people can contribute to open source, help other people free up uh, open source developers' time to do other things. So it's it's definitely hard. And every time somebody asks an issue, it is taking up time. Um, but hopefully, you know, contributing to projects either with money or buying the products they're related to um, can help open source companies hire more people that can do this type of work. I I guess probably because of being around with the dinosaurs, I still don't understand how open source companies can make money. Do, do you have any insight into that? Yeah, so one of the things with Great Scott Gadgets is that we do um, sell products like the HackRF or the Ubertooth or soon uh, we'll be coming out with Luna, which is something that Kate Temkin's been putting a lot of time into. And it's that hardware that really supports the company. Um, and so anytime anyone buys one of the actual Great Scott Gadgets pieces of hardware, it is funding things like creating new hardware or me uh, helping with these pull requests or GitHub issues. Um, and so that's the number one way people can support us. And we hope that you know our hardware is uh, what people buy instead of the knockoffs because um, of the customer support we provide and some of the guarantees that our um, resellers provide as well. And so, you know, it's part of that ecosystem and giving back to the community. And if people want to give back to our company, um, buy our hardware. It's really helpful. Well, and, and this Luna board, looking at it, it's a does protocol analysis for USB, um, it, it works on creating your own USB device. It has an FPGA to help all of this. I, I wouldn't want to create that board. I mean, if I, if I wanted to use that board, I would not first want to build it. I would just want to use it. Um, yeah. So I, I understand why people would buy the hardware instead of making it. And then that pays partially for the software as well as the hardware. Mm-hmm. I can understand yeah. that. Yeah, and hopefully um, another part of my job since I've come onto the company is uh, creating interesting types of swag, which hopefully, um, you know, we will give some away at conferences, but maybe some people might be interested in buying. So uh, hopefully I will get all of that up and running soon and uh, people have an option to support us by buying cool things that um, aren't just hardware. Well, as long as you're going to say that, I should point out that we have new swag and new merch in our Zazzle store. Um, <laughs> I did this talk with the the map file that talks about map files, um, <laughs> and now you can get you can get somebody actually printed it in a poster and sent me a picture of it on their wall, and somebody asked for mouse pads, and so I went ahead and made mouse pads and new mugs and people wanting to buy this stuff is really weird. I, I thought you had to give this away. I didn't realize people would buy it. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity to, you know, support the things you love. Yeah, it is. Um, even if, you know, you're not trying to make a lot of money off of it, it's also a way, as you said, with stickers, somebody will come in and say, what's that? And if you've got a neat mug or an embedded sticker or poster, I can totally see it. It's kind of cool. Well, I think I think it's about time to get back to our weekend. Um, do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Uh, on the topic of open source, contribute. I've been doing so much for the Great Scott Gadgets uh, repositories, and I would love to see people open more issues, open more pull requests, or even reach out to me if you want to talk to me about anything uh, Great Scott Gadgets. I am always here and happy to hear from new people. Our guest has been Straith, Brittany Posnikoff. You can find her at straith.com, that is S-T-R-A-I-T-H-E dot com, and of course there'll be a link in the show notes. Thanks, Straith. Thank you. Thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. 
And thank you for listening. You can always contact us at show at Embedded FM or hit the contact link on Embedded FM. And now a quote to leave you with. This is from William Gibson. Time moves in one direction, memory another. We are that strange species that constructs artifacts intended to counter the natural flow of forgetting.